Hello, thanks for joining us to, in this session today. I am Josette Lewis, a Chief Scientific Officer for the Alma Board of California. And I'm really pleased to be joined here by Lori Davies Adams, the President and CEO of Pollinator Partnership. We'll be joining the conference for the live Q&A following the session. So a reminder that if you have any questions, please feel free to enter them into the chat and we'll look forward to answering those questions. Uh, during the Q&A session that follows. So I thought I would start out with some basics about why we're talking so much about almonds and pollinators. One out of three bites of food that we eat depend upon pollinators when you look at our whole food supply. And so of course, since I think almonds are one of the most tasty and nutritious one of those bites, let's focus on almonds. I like to say that the partnership between almonds and bees is truly one designed by nature. Almonds evolved to require cross-pollination with a not very closely related uh, almond type. In many ways, it's nature's way of ensuring that almonds don't marry their cousins. And so the honeybee plays the role of matchmaker. Honeybees evolved alongside almonds to be very efficient at that job of taking pollen from one type of almond and delivering it to the proper location in the flower for the other type to, be, to, be, to produce a nut. Um, for the work that bees do, they're rewarded with abundant almond pollen and pollen that provides very high quality nutrition when there aren't very many plants blooming in the landscape that early in the year. So contrary to sometimes what we see in the popular press, UC Davis research shows that honeybee hives are actually stronger coming out of almonds than when they went in. And that's a result of this evolutionary relationship uh, that benefits both almonds and honeybees. For the almond industry to ensure that we don't put nature's perfect relationship on the rocks, we develop the honeybee best management practices. These are based on years of research, consultation with beekeepers, uh, almond growers, and um, e experts in the state and federal government. They're, we did that to ensure that they're science-based and that they're practical to implement. Uh, underlying this includes research that showed we needed to change some of our practices, particularly around pesticide use, to make sure that we're keeping bees safe. I do multiple trainings and we do a lot of outreach every year around these best management practices to ensure that they become standard practice among farmers and other professionals that work in the almond industry. We now are taking our commitment to responsible farming one step further. Those honeybee best management practices are embedded in one of our Orchard 2025 goals, which is to increase adoption of environmentally friendly pest management tools by 2020, by 25% by the year 2025. Um, so keeping bees safe is our very first job uh, in almonds. And we're now working to go beyond that, to add forage and habitat for honeybees and for other pollinators. Uh, a big part of this is adding cover crops to the orchard. Uh, cover crops are gaining momentum as a conservation tool nationally and internationally, but particularly for bees, it adds diversity to their diet beyond the uh, already very strong nutrition from almond pollen. And very importantly, it extends the forage beyond the almond bloom. So that is why research shows that uh, hives are healthier. They're not only stronger, but they're actually healthier coming out of orchards that have almonds and cover crops combined. Of course, cover crops can also offer benefits to growers, can prove access to the orchard during the rainy season uh, when the, the ground might be uh, muddy. It reduces soil compaction, which is very important for the health of the trees so those tree roots can breathe. If you think about almond harvest, it involves putting some heavy machinery through the orchard every year that can compact that soil and constrain um, water infiltration and aeration of those roots. Uh, research also shows that cover crops can increase the soil water holding capacity, something that's very important to us in a state uh, that is a Mediterranean climate and doesn't get um, as abundant rain as other parts of the country. And it provides uh, uh, benefit 
provides an environment for beneficial microbes that can help nutrient cycling and nutrient uptake by the trees. This month, we're really excited to release a new tool to help growers uh, give cover crops a try and, and to make sure they get the most out of a uh, cover crop. We're also going to fund a second year of what we call the B Plus Scholarship. Uh, B Plus Scholarship provided um, uh, cover crop seed to the first 100 growers, as well as uh, the registration fee for bee friendly farming, which you'll hear about next. But most importantly, these uh, activities are ways for us to build awareness. People start hearing a lot about cover crops from us. Uh, it reduces the risk of trying something new and it creates momentum. A lot of growers learn by looking at what their neighbor is doing. So if they look over in the spring and see a beautiful cover crop, perhaps one that's flowering, or maybe even when they look over now and things have gotten a little messier looking as those cover crops dry out naturally and look a bit more like weeds, if they see that more often, they become comfortable with these ideas. Well, we see significant opportunity to expand the use of cover crops, and that's what a lot of these efforts are, are for. I want to really caution about seeing cover crops as a panacea that fits on every farm, particularly here in California. Establishment of a good cover crop, certainly definitely something as lush as you see in that uh, picture on the guide that, we'll, that uh, we released this month. That requires good timing of fall rains. Um, as most almond growers have moved to highly efficient irrigation systems, things like double line drip and micro sprinklers, we don't really uh, deliver water to those rows in between the trees. We are being highly efficient and giving the trees just the right amount of water where they need it. And so getting good establishment of a cover crop, it can be very difficult in, in years where the fall rains came very late as they did this past fall or in parts of the state, particularly the southern part of the Central Valley where precipitation is much lighter. In all the work that I've talked about, we rely a lot on partnerships. Uh, when we did the B Plus Scholarship, what made that successful last year is that we could tap into Project APSM's Seed for Bees program that provides uh, pollinator-friendly cover crop mixes to growers and provides a lot of technical assistance to address questions that they may have. So that was a key to uh, making that program very successful. We work with Be Informed Partnership. This is a program for beekeepers that provides technical assistance to beekeepers and I think everyone in the beekeeping industry would say collect some of the most valuable data on national statistics on the state of the health of the nation's beehives. We also work through the Honey Bee Health Coalition. It's a way for us in almonds to contribute to bee health the other 10 months out of the year when they're not in almond orchards, when they're in other crops and in other regions of the country. It's a way for us to advocate for and inform um, practices for bee health throughout uh, throughout the country. And last but not least is pollinator partnership. I'll let Lori tell more tell you more about their work and then the two of us will talk about uh, how we're growing that collaboration in almonds and beyond almonds. So over to you Lori. Oh thank you Josette. Uh, yes we've had a wonderful I think it's been at least a 15 year partnership uh, with the Almond Board of California, but I think in the last couple of years, things have really, really begun to focus and bear fruit. So we're very excited about the collaboration we've done through the B Plus Scholarship, and it has taken advantage of the Bee Friendly Farming system that we have. Now, Bee Friendly Farming is for all cropping systems, but in 2020 alone, we uh, at least certified 55,000 acres of almonds. And that's an important figure because that's a great start, but it's not the only thing we do. Obviously we operate across the United States and in fact, across North America. And we will be introducing this month of uh, Bee Friendly Farming Australia. So that has all resulted this 55,000 acres in uh, 20,000 acres of additional habitat. Now, one of the things that we talk about is the need for additional habitat. Almond bloom, as uh, we heard from Josette, is actually a very nutritious source uh, for uh, honeybees in particular. 
and yet they still need additional nutrition to keep healthy. And so additional cover crops, additional field edge plantings, additional hedgerows, these are things that not only support the pollination services that are happening through the honeybee, but they support native pollinators, everything from hoverflies and some beneficial beetles uh, to native bees. And so this is really building in biodiversity in the orchard. Now, you heard a little bit about integrated pest management as one of the things that the Almond Board of California through its CASP program has really helped their growers understand and adopt. And it's one of their goals for 2025 is to get more adoption of that. We support that completely. And I'll talk a little bit more about it because that's one of the tenants of our certification. I want to emphasize that this is a cooperative conservation and voluntary stewardship program. The growers come to this knowing that they're going to have to invest in something that will support pollinators, but it will also support farms and orchards and bring benefits to them. So how do you get certified? Well, there are seven criteria. The first is to offer forage that provides this good nutrition for bees on at least 3% of the land. So that can include the cover crop we talked about if the cover crop is left to bloom. So the cover crop is eliminated before harvest, but it has to stay there in order to provide uh, the nectar and the pollen that the pollinators need. The next thing is the bloom has to be extended for, but with flowering plants throughout the growing season. So especially in the early spring, and this is when the almond bloom happens, and all the way through the late autumn, there needs to be flowering resources. There's no minimum land coverage for seasonal bloom, but there has to be this continuous seasonal bloom. Now, if it's not... Uh, inhibited or prohibited by government mandated water restrictions, you need to offer clean water for bees and that's largely for honeybees, but when they are pollinating, uh, they need to have access to clean water. We also ask that you provide permanent habitat for nesting through features like the hedgerows and the natural brush and buffer strips or even bare ground uh, where native bees can uh, nest. This is a photo here of a uh, vineyard that has uh, in Bee Friendly Farming certified. The fifth thing is this integrated pest management, and it is the, the support that we use for our blanket statement, which is reduce or eliminate the use of chemicals. How do we get people to that point where they can reduce or eliminate the use of chemicals? Well, integrated pest management is really a design for thinking about pests. It's a mindset that makes the grower not think of the chemical first, but think about the problem, assessing the problem, defining the problem, more than that, preventing the problem. So it actually has a system that helps you work through your pest problems without rushing to a chemical or to a new chemical, uh, which we know can not only create more problems, but it can breed resistance in the actual uh, chemical that you may ultimately need for a severe pest infestation. Next, you have to pay an annual fee. That's what we use. Uh, it's very modest. We really make this so that every farmer can participate. That's one of our goals. We wanna make sure that this is widely adopted, not just in large and well-financed uh, farming operations. We want every farm to be available to this program and this program available to every farm. So every three years, we have a compliance form that requires uh, the uh, verification of these practices. And that is audited by a task force that we've put together that includes growers, scientists, uh, USDA officials, uh, as well as officials of the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. So we make sure that uh, this is validated and verified by this uh, task force. So those are the seven ways to get uh, certified, but there's so many reasons to get certified. I'd love to tell you more about uh, Bee Friendly Farming. I urge you to go to our website, which is pollinator.org 
forward slash BFF, but pollinator.org in and of itself is a treasure trove of over a thousand pages of information, everything from uh, nutrition and information about uh, how valuable pollinated foods are to golf courses, to schools, uh, to gardens. So we have information for everyone because we know we need so many landscapes working in harmony to make sure that pollinators are a resource that we pass on for generation to generation to generation uh, because they're so valuable as, as uh, Josette said, it's one out of every third bite of food for us, but it's also the food for wildlife. And it's also very important in carbon sequestration. Uh, the pollinated plants help prevent erosion. Uh, there is so much good that happens with this relationship between pollinators and plants. So I urge you to go to our website and you'll find a whole lot of information that I think will be valuable for you. Thanks, Lori. Um, so I thought we could talk a little bit more about some of the criteria for bee friendly farming. When we started down a pathway with you of looking at how you interpret that those criteria that you just outlined, um, providing 3% of the uh, area in forage uh, through different blooms. We don't count the almond trees. Let me just say right. it's not an easy lift for almonds. So we, we had to lean in on cover crops. Um, and as I talked about, that's um, a good tool, but not an easy tool for everybody. I have to say, I was more pleasantly surprised when, when it came to hedgerows, which is important for the habitat and also maybe those uh, um, different uh, uh, blossoms all year round uh, can provide additional timing for flowering plants. Um, when we looked at the, the data in the California Almond Sustainability Program, uh, over half of almond growers report that they have hedgerows. So that was really exciting. So maybe one part that's really hard and one part that's um, already pretty well widely adopted in the almond industry. Um, so as you've um, looked at uh, uh, these 55,000 acres now in almonds, um, one of the things we've really valued is the flexibility in how you meet those, even though we've defined the criteria for now as requiring cover crops and hedgerows. But you're out there working with almond growers on this. So what are some of the different models that you're seeing and um, how are you kind of finding this balance between flexibility and making sure that um, you have some really science-based criteria that people have to meet? Yeah, uh, well, it's it's not all almond orchards are the same. They're not all in the same uh, location. We obviously, as I said, advocate for all pollinators. So we're looking at uh, a full complement of pollinating species that need to have resources. And uh, we know that every orchard is still governed by the geography, by the precipitation, by uh, the landscape that, a jet, that uh, abuts it. So we have to look at not being too prescriptive about how this, uh, this forage is provided. And it can be uh, buffer strips, it can be between the rows, it can be permanent, it can be cover crop, but it also can be in adjacent parcels. And the reason that that's important is because there are some landscapes where it just would not work to try to put in this pollinator habitat, but they may be next to less productive landscapes. It may be uh, things that are already out of production. It can be even the landscapes that border uh, outbuildings and uh, other non-cropped landscapes. This is still providing forage and the pollinators are perfectly happy to accept it in those circumstances. In addition, there are things like solar arrays, which are coming more and more in uh, farm landscapes and in agriculture across the country. They provide a wonderful uh, opportunity for pollinator uh, forage that can be planted around it. They have to be, it has to be, again, it's specific. So it has to have low growing uh, uh, shrub-like uh, resources. Um, there have been some studies that have even shown that it can Im increase the effectiveness of the solar arrays because it keeps the heat down on the landscape. So there are benefits to all of these things, but you have to be flexible. And again, in the kinds of plants that are selected for this, 
Native plants are wonderful. They're not always needed for cover crops. They're rarely used, but uh, even in permanent plantings, you can use some perennials that are introduced but not invasive that can provide wonderful floral resources, particularly as we've asked farmers to look at the full growing season. It's not easy to get all of those places within the growing season filled. And we're building more of a demand for native plants, but they're still very, very expensive and very hard to source on occasion. So we want to have this flexibility to build in the forage. In many instances, we are starting at zero. So everything that we add is a benefit to the pollinator community, and we're going to only build on that. But I think flexibility is important in addition because the grower knows his landscape and the grower knows the availability and what they also know how to grow things. So it's really helpful. Uh, again, water is often part of the restriction. So if there is a riparian area that can be uh, safely planted with pollinator plantings, that's another solution. So uh, flexibility is gonna make this happen. If we're too rigid, uh, we won't be able to scale. Yeah, maybe to pick up on that, I mean, I think you, um, you touched upon, you know, this flexibility also is a great opportunity to, as we look at um, the implementation of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, we know that some um, lands may come out of agricultural production, and so there's a great opportunity um, on individual growers. The solar race is very interesting because as I drive around, um, those are often right next to the irrigation pumps because they're there to drive the irrigation system. And so it's much easier to perhaps irrigate a, uh, a pollinator habitat in those locations than it would be in other parts of the, the farm or the orchard where um, installing additional irrigation um, systems would be very cost prohibitive for some growers. So interesting opportunities to be creative um, and something that we hope to continue to explore with you. I think the other area, and you touched upon this in your criteria, is the importance of integrated pest management. Um, and of course, we have uh, um, pesticide management issues embedded in, in our honeybee best management practices. And it's part of our um, Orchard 2025 goal is to really expand the use of the non-chemical, uh, the cultural and uh, other management practices that can be very effective. So can you talk a little bit more about the pollinator partnerships approach to this? Because I think some people come in very simplistically thinking, well, just don't use any. Um, and um, you have, um, I think, tried to find some uh, practical ways forward on that issue, if you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think um, the, the integrated pest management is a, a way of starting to think about pests well before you have them. So that's... The, the key is you start early and you start thinking and you think about what are the measures I can do to prevent these pests and infestations? How can I monitor to see what's really going on in my, in my uh, orchard? Uh, with that monitoring, how, how do I know when I've met an economic threshold where this pest really needs my attention? Uh, and what are my application decisions? What are my product decisions? Can I use biocontrols? Uh, mating disruption, for example, uh, for navel orange worm. How can I use a product that has the least uh, residual toxicity? How can I make sure that this product uh, will not be applied during bloom? How can I make sure that this product uh, will not be applied when there's the possibility of drift? Some of these are legal constraints, but in the heat of the moment, they're not always adhered to. And that's what we have to really instill in the grower. Yes, they do. You must do this. And uh, the timing of the application is critical. Uh, is there foraging going on, not just of honeybees, but of any pollinator? What are the technical aspects if you have to use a chemical? Uh, nozzle adjustments, uh, the, the type of application, whether it's aerial or uh, a trench, uh, uh, a drench, 
you have to make sure that what you're doing every step of the way is a conscious decision. So you're not going according to the calendar, you're going to the reality on the field and, and, and in the field. So uh, for us, it's, it's a way of having everybody understand that these interactions are gonna take place in the orchard and how can we make sure that unintended consequences beneficial insects are not impacted if in fact you have to use a chemical. And in many cases, you might not have to, but if you're really smart, you started way back in the prevention side. So integrated pest management is also something you have to prove. You have to actually not just say, oh yes, I did that. You have to actually show us how you kept records, how you monitored, uh, the kinds of steps you took, how many applications you actually did. Uh, all of this is uh, information that we need in order to certify that you are bee friendly. So it's a methodology, it's a way of thinking, it's a way of giving the farmer a tool, no matter what problem or what chemistry comes along. Great. Yeah. And I, I just echo that's, I think the Almond Board has been investing in integrated pest management for over 40 years. It's really the cornerstone of, um, of uh, our um, productivity enhancement for the industry and, and, uh, and a real commitment to sustainability. Um, so, I mean, maybe I should add here too that, because I know this is a uh, top of mind for a lot of folks is neonicotinoids. And I would just offer that those are um, very rarely used in almond production compared to some other crops. Um, so at the end of my talk, I, I mentioned that we have a lot of partners that we work with on pollinators. I uh, joke that I've become really good friends with folks in the beekeeping industry, for example, uh, which has its sweet returns, I could just add. Um, but I would say of all those organizations, really Pollinator Partnership has been one of the most transformative. It's really, ex it's pushed us to think beyond honeybees, which is something that um, is a valued input in our industry and really got us to think about native pollinators as well um, through, your, through talking with you and participating in, in meetings that you guys host. Um, and I was really excited uh, to work with you last month to launch the California Pollinator Coalition. We both co-chair that with Secretary Karen Ross, whom the participants may have heard from uh, during this virtual orchard tour. Um, it's first time the Almond Board's really stepped up and led something uh, with all of our sister organizations in agriculture here in California. We had over 20 founding members. Um, together representing most of the California agricultural lands, together with some really great uh, national conservation groups. Um, all of us united under the goal of expanding habitat on working lands for pollinators. So for us, this was a real step into a leadership role on uh, pollinators beyond honeybees, but this is uh, part of your day job. You work on pollinator issues all year round and all over the country. So. For you, what do you see as the opportunity with this California Pollinator Coalition? Oh, I, I love that question because this uh, this poll California Pollinator Coalition is the opportunity to bring the dialogue uh, of the things that can be done and not just putting in habitat, but also integrated pest management. So we wanna bring uh, pollinators into the landscape and then we wanna protect them with these management processes. But this is really the first time that I can remember where all of agriculture and, and literally the coalition represents most of the acreage uh, from the Cattlemen's Association to the citrus growers, to the almond board, to Western growers, to the Farm Bureau, to, uh, to the alfalfa growers. This is, I mean, and more. This is bringing all of those voices and all of those problems together with all of the conservation groups that really want to work with working lands, who really want to say, we can't help pollinators if we don't have the working lands of California on our side and with us and with us on their side. So this coalition represents great growing and great pollinator sustainability. And in many ways, the agricultural community and the pollinator community are facing 
a lot of similar problems. In California, the temperatures are rising faster than they are in the rest of the country. Uh, we have fires, uh, we have drought, we have reduced landscape. The real estate press is hard for, not just for agriculture and to keep growing 40% of the food that the nation eats, but it also is hard for these habitats that pollinators desperately need. They need the real estate so that they can exist, so that they can forage, so that they can have the food to provide us the pollination services. And again, not just for agriculture, but for ecosystem services that are for wild landscapes as well. So for me, this dialogue, and it's going to be a running dialogue, and we're going to try projects, some of them will work, some of them won't work, but we're going to try and keep everybody together with these goals of adding biodiversity to the working landscapes, protecting it, and learning as we go in a dialogue. And in a time frame when optimism has been uh, sometimes uh, hard to find, for me, this kind of work means that people are willing to set aside a few things and work together on larger goals. And that's, a, for me, a model for how we're going to solve problems going forward. And we're going to have lots and lots of problems to solve. So for me, this is really one of the most exciting developments uh, that you could ever have. And yeah, it's going to be a, it's not going to be an easy lift. It's going to be something that we have to build on, but I couldn't be more excited. Great. Well, you might have just answered this, but as we wrap up, uh, what is your vision for the future for pollinators, uh, the relationship between pollinators and agriculture? Oh, uh, my vision is that we'll keep growing. We'll keep involving more and more organizations, uh, both on the grower side and on the conservation side. We'll build more partnerships and ultimately we'll be able to produce quality food at a reasonable price that's sustainably grown for the next generation and the next generation, along with pollinators that are going to supply pollination services, but also they're going to provide the, the carbon sequestration, uh, the beauty, uh, the diversity that we need in our landscapes that currently are, are in need of that diversity. So my vision is uh, a California in bloom. That's my vision. And uh, it's going to happen because people who voluntarily came together and said, this is important to us. And I think agriculture is definitely leading the way on this, but conservation is right there in a supportive role. We're going to do great things. Thanks. Well, I would just echo that vision uh, for working together. Um, and, you know, I've spent most of most of my life here in the state, and I'm always struck by the statistic that almost half of California's lands are public lands. Um, and so they're in some form of conservation, something I enjoy enormously when my free time hiking and camping and backpacking and such. Um, but I realize those are really mostly in the mountainous areas that surround the Central Valley. And when you look at the Central Valley, most of that is privately held land. So for me, that means that agriculture has to be part of the solution. And I think this coalition and the kind of work we talked about here today shows that we can if we work together and find um, pathways forward that, um, that work for both sides. So really thankful for the partnership that we've had with you, it's partnerships everywhere in your name and in our uh, in our working relationships. But thanks again for joining me for this session, Lori. And again, for folks who uh, have any questions, please enter them in the chat. And Lori and I will be looking forward to answering those in the live Q and A that follows. Thanks again for joining us today. All right, so we have a number of questions and I'll get us started, Lori. There's a few questions around cover crops. What types of um, plants are used in cover crops and what happens when uh, they dry out sort of at the end of the green season here in California? So in terms of the types of plants, there are a variety of organizations that provide cover crop mixes. Um, I would say generally they fall into two categories, the pollinator mixes and the soil builder mixes, as they're often called. And um, a very common uh, 
source of cover crop seed in the almond industry is Project Apis M, a group that has a program called Seeds for Bees. Um, and so those cover crops include um, things like mustard, which is actually a wild uh, plant here in California. It's very yellow and is very good for pollinators and blooms very early in the year, works well in a Mediterranean climate. And then uh, typically there are some uh, uh, clover species that are in there as well, a couple different kinds of clover that add nitrogen back into the soil. And then some include various native grasses, which can be also uh, valuable for the, the roots that help improve soil quality. So that typically a mix usually has multiple species in it because um, here in California where winter rains are not um, uh, easy to predict and where moisture is so important for the establishment of the cover crop, it usually you want a mix of species in there so you kind of diversify the opportunity for something to succeed. Um, and then as I mentioned in the in the video there, the cover crops here when our, our um, natural moisture, the winter rains and dew uh, is over for the season, as is typical in a Mediterranean climate, uh, long about May, things start to dry out and become a little less attractive. Um, and so there was a question about fire risk damage associated with brush. Uh, first of all, these are not really woody species, so they're typically more like wildflowers that dry out. Uh, so there are a little less fire risk, but the important thing is that in almonds, we recommend mowing the cover crop down sometime late in the spring when it's done its job for pollinators, uh, because then um, it doesn't compete with the trees for water use. Again, water is such a critical resource and one that we need to manage sustainably. So we recommend mowing the cover crop um, in April or May, uh, sometimes as late as June. So that's a couple of the things around cover crops and um, we'll take some more questions. Yeah, I wanna just add to that, that a cover crop is not a new idea. It's having a resurgence. It was an early agricultural practice that is not just in almonds, but all across agriculture. People are planting these cover crops and they're being encouraged to keep them in bloom before they turn them over in the soil so that they can actually help pollinators uh, at the same time that they're helping uh, the soil. So I have a question for you that's in the chat and I'm gonna ask right. uh, that. Um, how is the almond industry in California working to reduce pesticide use to promote bee health? Yeah, so in our BBMPs, there's really uh, the most important um, components are all about reducing risk to honeybees from uh, use of pesticides in particular. So we have a number of, uh, we've funded quite a bit of research over the years to understand the impact of pesticides on honeybees. I think, to be honest, this I uh, thought it was pretty impressive myself when I joined the Almond Board because in many ways we're showing that we may need to change our practices. So we're not shying away from funding research that may show that we have some problems we need to address. And that research has, has given us a number of very specific recommendations we make to growers. The first is uh, that they should not need to use any insecticides during the time when honeybees are present. Um, and that uh, message has been very strongly heard. Uh, research by um, that's been published by Ohio State has shown that we've reduced insecticide use during the dormant season by almost 70%, 70. So really good indication we're on the right track. Additionally, uh, during bloom time, which is often still during the wet season here in California, mm -hmm. growers may get fungal disease that develops on the bloom and that can affect the um, developing nut. So fungicide use, we recommend that that's, if it's needed, that it is applied at night when honeybees are not present. Um, and that is a very easy way to manage the risk to honeybees. And then lastly, most recently, we have funded research that shows that um, additives called adjuvants, these are additives to pesticides that can improve the stick on the leaves or um, uh, improve the um, spread across the, um, the surface of the plant, that those can, certain classes of those can have impacts on honeybees. And so we recommend not adding adjuvants um, if need, uh, unless specifically called for on the label. So we've seen, um, 
uh, that we can use research to help drive practical benef uh, changes to the way we grow almonds and improve our sustainability and improve our um, reduce the risk to honeybees. We've also set a goal as an industry to expand use of environmentally friendly pest management practices by 25% by 2025. And embedded in those practices are these types of things that I just spoke to around bee health. So they are integral to our IPM programs and our goals to expand use of those IPM practices. So those are some of the ways that we um, uh, are reducing risks. And then of course, many of the things we talked about today with cover crops and adding habitat and forage to the almond landscape is about adding additional benefits, improved nutrition and, and providing uh, uh, flowering plants, uh, food resources to pollinators beyond honeybees when they leave our orchards. Okay, so taking another question. We had some questions about other types of bees and the role of other types of bees in almonds and um, in these uh, and habitat around almond orchards. So I think this is a case where it's important to remember that almonds are not a native plant to the United States. In fact, lots of uh, things that we eat and grow here are not. And honeybees were brought over by the colonists to pollinate fruit trees, uh, particularly apples and pears um, back in the founding of, um, of those colonies. And so almonds, uh, are blooming at a time in the landscape when our native bees here in California are not generally that active. So we cannot rely on native bees to pollinate almonds. And that is why we rely on honeybees, a species that they did evolve with back in their center of origin throughout human history. So honeybees will always be critical. There have been research that uh, we have funded along with others to look at other bee species like uh, blue orchard bees as potential opportunities, but they did not prove to be economically viable to get those um, bees present in the orchard at the levels necessary for producing almonds. Um, so many of the native bees are not highly active. Some of the research we funded um, demonstrates that when they've done surveys in the orchard, looking at um, visitation by honeybees and native bees to cover crops and to almonds, um, that verifies there are just not that many native bees present at that early time in the year. Um, however, by planting cover crops, by putting in habitats such as hedgerows, riparian buffers, even sort of pollinator pastures on parts of farm that are not being actively managed, we do know that those are great for native bees. And those native bees, when they are present and even in low numbers, can actually uh, create a little competition for the honeybees and sort of gets the honeybee to up their game and they do a better job of pollinating. So there is a win-win, but I would say uh, that really the point of planting pollinator habitat is to, um, to expand the benefits and to integrate um, almonds into a healthy ecosystem here in the Central Valley. Lori, you're more of an expert on native bees. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Well, there, I think the way to look at this is more uh, the managed bees uh, versus the wild bees, the ones that come on their own and the ones that are managed by humans for agriculture. So obviously the honeybee is uh, a managed bee, but there are other managed bees. Bumblebees can be uh, managed, alfalfa leafcutter bees. You mentioned the blue orchard bee, the osmia. Those bees are used in agriculture uh, and they're used purposefully. They're brought to the agricultural field. But you can also have, as Josette pointed out, you can have the circumstance where you have wild bees that also help with the pollination. Uh, one good example in California agriculture, though not in almonds, is the hoverfly. So we have a whole series of uh, sort of invisible workers that help with our agricultural production, but they also help with the biodiversity. They help with the plants that also feel, feed other wild species, birds, bears, other wildlife rely on pollinated plants as well. So let me ask you another question. I um, think our time may be running out. <laughs> so <laughs> it really went by quickly. Um, so we appreciate everyone asking, uh, entering their questions, and I think we will be. Uh, 
trying to reach out and provide answers to those that we weren't able to address today. Um, but I hope you will stay tuned. We have some great sessions following. We have um, on the very topic of pollination an opportunity to go and meet with a grower in his orchard and learn about what he does and how um, he sees benefits from that. So I hope you'll stay tuned to that section. And then also later this morning, um, uh, an additional uh, session on nutrition, looking at almonds and cardiometabolic health. And Lori, you were just telling me right before we joined the group, a really interesting fact that I want to give you time to mention here today about um, the importance of pollinators and health. Well, I wanted to mention this because I know we have a lot of nutritionists in the audience and uh, almonds are a wonderful superfood really for nutrition. But I wanted you to realize that pollinators are very important in all 10 of the top rated Andy foods, which are the aggregate nutrient density index. Every single one of them requires a visit from a pollinator in order to produce its fruit. So all of the micronutrients that we get, the antioxidants, the things that really keep us thriving are brought to you by pollinators. So I want you to think about that when you're considering nutrition and when you're writing about it in particular. This pollination process is critical to our health. Well, thanks again, Lori, and for all of you for joining us today. Sorry, the time was so short on the question part, um, but I do hope you'll visit our resources page as part of the platform because there's a lot of great resources, including our honeybee BMPs um, are present there. So stay tuned for another session on Pollinator with uh, Ben King on his farm and for uh, the additional sessions on health today. Thanks for joining us. Thanks.